Hello, everybody. So when that was over, Chris, I had several people come up to me and say, I hope you got something good <laughs> for Arkansas. And it reminded me, reminded me of in 2 Samuel chapter 16, when David is fleeing, when his son has staged a rebellion against him, and someone named Shimei, the son of Gerah, begins following him, cursing him, and throwing rocks at him. And Abishai, one of David's warriors, came up to him and said, My Lord, do you want me to bring you his head? <laughs> and David said, said, Leave him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has so ordered him. <laughs> it may be that the Lord will look on my affliction and that the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing this day. So in the words of another famous Alabamian, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> the title that I've, been, that I've been given, the subject I've been assigned is that of revive. And uh, it's a few things I enjoy talking about more than revival. And so that's what we're going to do today. And revival is a word that you hear a lot, and that's a good thing. Sometimes when the church talks about something so much that it becomes white noise, that's because we have the right attitude. It's not always a bad thing. Revival is a very good thing, and we kind of all know what it is, but let's take a second to define this term uh, very carefully. Revival is an extraordinary work of the Holy Spirit when he shows his power in a visible, noticeable, demonstrable way. We are commanded in the Bible to do the ordinary things that we just discussed. Thank you, Chris, for going through that in Acts chapter 2. That's what the church is to do normally. Revival is when the Holy Spirit comes along and fills it up with power. And all of a sudden, the things that we've always done seem way more effective than they ever have before. And it runs way beyond us. And God gets all the glory. And we're going to talk about the kind of things that happen in a revival. But it's, it's an extraordinary work of the Spirit affecting the ordinary work of the church. Now, in the days that we live today, I mean, you, you can't even keep track of the number of people and the number of times folks have said, what America needs is a revival. I would agree. I would very much agree with that, that we need a revival because we look back on previous generations and we see what previous generations have done in the revivals that they did or even just faithful men of God that didn't maybe see a revival but the hand of the Lord was surely upon them. And we look around at little old us and we say, well, we're not living up to that guy. We're not living up to that generation. We feel like King Theoden from the Lord of the Rings said, a lesser son of greater sires am I. Or like Jacob when he stood before Pharaoh and he said, Short and full of trouble have been the days of my sojourning, and they have not attained to the days of the years of my fathers. And sometimes that's exactly how we feel in the church. My days have not attained to the days of the years of my fathers. And we say, I wish I could have lived during that time, or in that day, or with that preacher, or that revival. And we say, we need one of these too. And I would agree with you. But the, the thing is that we are had this American manly attitude, which is a good thing. It's all right, so what do we do? Right? We're, we're cowboys and pioneers. We went to the moon. We built the atom bomb. We know how to fix and do things. But we come up against a problem when it comes to revival because it is a work of the Spirit. And there are, there are some, like Charles Finney and others, that, that have this attitude that the church can bring about a revival just about whenever they want if they'll do the following things. And with all due respect to him, he lived during a revival. So, yeah, of course he would say that. But what does the scripture say? I'll tell you, the only instruction that we are given in the Bible to achieve and attain a revival is to pray. That's what we're going to talk about today. Fervent, devoted prayer. Old Testament, 2 Chronicles 7.14. Everybody knows this one. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. That was in Solomon's temple. He says, if the day comes where you need me, you got to get on your knees and pray. New Testament Jesus in Luke eleven thirteen. 13, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit 
to those who ask him. Which is why sometimes people get a little too clever and they say we shouldn't ask for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is already with us. Well, Jesus Christ told us to ask for the power of the Holy Spirit. A revival is a work of the Spirit. When God is ready to move in his sovereignty, as he always does, he stirs up his people. And he stirs up his people specifically to pray. Which is why you should be very encouraged that it seems every quarter of the church, not just the charismatic Pentecostal side, not just the uh, Reformed and, and more Calvinist side, everybody's talking about the need for revival and the need to pray for revival. That must mean that God is up to something. And God is stirring up his people. He stirs up his people to pray. But as we know from the Garden of Gethsemane, when God stirs up his people to pray, the enemy is also at work to distract the people from prayer. Chris said it, prayer is the heavy artillery of the church. So if Satan can stop us from doing one thing, he's going to stop us from praying. He's going to put us to sleep in the garden. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And I'd say one of the ways that we're being distracted from seeking the Lord in prayer while still recognizing the need for divine intervention and the need for revival, the reason we don't come to it in prayer, one among many, is because the enemy has convinced us that this generation is different. This is unique. These are times the world has never seen before. This is something different, and so we need something different. And some people who should know better are saying things like, the gospel is not enough anymore. The word of God is not enough anymore. Loving people is, is for other times. We can't love people. Now we've got to take a stand. And I ask when people in this situation, they say, we've got to do something. We've got to do something. And I say, well, we're doing church and we're preaching the word and we're praying. Well, that's not enough. Well, what are we to do? And very often, we don't really have an answer to that because it's deception. It's not like there's something obvious that we're neglecting to do. But the enemy is convincing us that the work of the Spirit is not enough. It's insufficient. So let's look to the Word then. If this generation is so different and we're not living up to the days of our fathers, well, let's look at some other people in Scripture that lived in similar days that the Lord then used. We're going to look today at three examples of people who went beyond their predecessors, which is what I'm praying for. The Jesus movement was great, but I'm ready for the next Jesus movement. We've had two great awakenings. How about a third really great awakening? Looking for the next thing. Three examples that we're going to look at today. Three passages of scripture. The first one is in Exodus chapter 33. And again, the similar theme here is these are people that saw a work of the Lord that went beyond what their predecessor had done and how prayer was the common denominator in all three of these. This is in Exodus 33. They're at Mount Sinai. They've already left the land of Egypt. Moses took his tent, verse 7, and pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp, and called it the tabernacle or the tent of meeting. Pause. This is not the capital T tabernacle that had the holy place and the Ark of the Covenant. This was a separate, like a prayer chapel that Moses would set up. And it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of meeting, which was outside the camp. So it was whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle that all the people rose and each man stood at his tent door and watched Moses until he had gone into the tabernacle. They used to say at George Whitfield that God would set him on fire and people would come to watch him burn. Same kind of thing. And it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle, the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. That Shekinah glory of God would move to where Moses was. And all the people saw the pillar of cloud, verse 10, standing at the tabernacle door. And all the people rose and worshiped each man in his tent door. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And he would return to the camp. But here's our focus now. But his servant, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. He camped out in that tabernacle. Moses would go and pray and hear from the Lord. But Joshua would stay. The first ingredient of revival that we want to look for is called victory. This is when culture changes. When the kingdom of God advances and pushes back the darkness and everything that has happened to claw away at what, the God, what God has done before is stripped off in just a few short days, weeks, and years. 
in the Welsh revival. Bars closed. Courtrooms stood idle and the judges had nothing to do. The coal miners were not able to drive their animals in the coal mines anymore because they weren't cursing at them and the animals didn't know what they were saying. (laughs) Seriously. In the book of Ephesus, or sorry, in the book of Acts, in the city of Ephesus, the idol makers who made silver idols staged a riot because so many people were turning to Christ, they weren't buying idols anymore and they were being hit in their wallet where it hurt. That's what revival does. It pulls back. There's victory in the culture. And this is the first thing that we want revival for. And in fact, this is, in many cases, the only thing people want revival for. We want to see wickedness and and injustice reversed in our day. We want to see things taken back. And we just saw Roe v. Wade overturned. Praise God for that. It's been 50 years. (laughs) Praise the Lord. And I'll, I'll say this too. We don't need to dunk Now that we've won, we don't need to do a little dance in the end zone, but you still need to be celebrating that the Lord has had his victory. Imagine something like that happening every day or every week. That's what happens in revivals, man. In a family, these generational sins just get removed. Problems that we've been praying for for decades are just dealt with. And even if the laws don't change, the people's hearts change. So we don't need to change the laws because they're not going to do it anyway. That's what Joshua saw. Joshua did what Moses could not do. He led the people into the promised land and drove the Canaanites out. He laid hold of the promises of God and they got to see what it looks like when God is in charge of his people. A righteous rule and a righteous reign. Now what prepared Joshua for that? If we want to be like that and see that kind of thing, He had a dogged commitment to abide in that tent of meeting and to pray. Do you catch this? Joshua prayed more than Moses did. And Moses talked to God face to face. But Joshua never left that tent of meeting. Moses would show up to meet with God and there's Joshua praying. And then the Shekinah glory would come and Joshua would be there as Moses spoke to the Lord. Joshua prayed Even when Moses was long gone, he continued to pray. So because Joshua refused to be put off from the presence of God and refused to stop praying and went even beyond his predecessor in prayer, he went beyond his predecessor in his life and his ministry also. He went beyond Moses. He got to see the promised land. He got to drive out the Canaanites. He got to see the sun stand still and the walls come tumbling down. And that's what we want to see too. The late Reverend Jerry Falwell said, nothing of eternal value is ever accomplished apart from prayer. He also said, all of our failures are prayer failures. I want to read those two again. Nothing of eternal value is ever accomplished apart from prayer. And all of our failures are prayer failures. Now, you look at a guy like that. He founded the moral majority. He basically got Ronald Reagan elected. He did all these very public and political things. And we look at that and we say, yeah, that's what we want. We want to do more of that. We want to see more social change. Okay, well, the last guy that did this was pretty hopped up on prayer. That this is a spiritual thing. It's not the marches. It's not the rallies. It's not the fundraising. It's not the statements. It's not the the television appearances. It's prayer. It's prayer. I had, a, I had a professor in college, Pastor Dave Early. He's a great man of God. And whenever we used to talk about church history or the Bible, he'd say, if you want what they got, you got to do what they did. Here's our problem. Because these social issues that we see, sexual immorality running rampant or any number of laws that are unjust or people's hatred for the church, they seem carnal. They seem like physical problems. They seem like the kind of thing that a good president and a couple sound laws and maybe some police officers to enforce it could fix. But that's not the case. We say because these are fleshly problems, we must fight them in the flesh. And that's the deception. Because that is where you are weakest. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 and 4 says, Though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are not of the flesh but have divine power. I'd like some divine power to destroy strongholds. 
So when you operate in the flesh, flesh, brothers, you are operating at a disadvantage. You're showing up in your weakness. The enemy is not physical. The enemy is spiritual. The battle is spiritual. Ephesians 6, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And when you fight in the power because, or in the power of the Spirit, you have access to God's power, which is unlimited, which means when you fight in the Spirit, you have unlimited power at your disposal. Can you see why the enemy doesn't want us praying, men? You, don't you want to see this sexual immorality driven back into the shadows? Don't you want to see justice and righteousness in, in our public sphere? Don't you want to see regard for the church again? we got to do something. You're right. We've got to pray. Pray. You cannot control revival. You can't make it happen. You can't run out ahead of God and say, Lord, bless this mess. He won't do it. It's a spiritual thing. We're called to do the ordinary work and wait upon the Lord. And the only thing that we have been given to do in order to call the Holy Spirit to bless it is to pray. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 says, I desire first of all that men everywhere should pray for those who are in authority and rulers, the public sphere. You have all this fire. You have all this energy. You have all this, this desire to do something and see change and see things brought about that ought to be brought about to see that victory in the land. Take that fire and that energy, go into the tent of meeting and let it drive you to stay there and pray to seek the Lord. I want to see revival. Then you've got to pray. But if all we do is pray, then the enemy's going to have his way. No, he won't. No, he won't. Joshua knew that, and that's why he was ready. The second ingredient of revival is power. And I'm talking about supernatural Holy Ghost power right now. Every revival has the Spirit's miraculous works on display. That's one of the fun things about reading about revivals. As you hear about the Lord doing amazing, miraculous things, like all at once. Every one of our churches has stories of people being healed and dreams and visions and all of that. But at, re at revival time, God kind of crams it all into one. And these things become regular. I mean, in our Calvary Chapel, our own Jesus movement, demons were being cast out. Folks were being healed just regularly. Oh, come and get healed. You'll be healed. No problem. Revelations were given. Dreams and visions Read through the book of Acts. Acts 19.11 says that in Paul, God did unusual miracles or extraordinary miracles. I think a miracle on its own is pretty extraordinary, pretty unusual. But at revival time, God does things miraculously that even make other miracles look normal. They used to steal Paul's sweatbands when he was working, and they would run home and rub it on Grandma's forehead, and she'd get better. If a demon-possessed kid, and they would go and steal one of Paul's towels that he would wipe his hands off with and drop it on their demon-possessed kid and the demon would go out. That's unusual. That's extraordinary. But at revival time, that's what happens. And this is the part that gets most of us excited. We want to see signs and wonders, don't you? Does anybody on this side of the room want to see signs and wonders? I do. I'll tell you I do. So turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 2. We're going to read about somebody that saw a few signs and wonders, who also went beyond his predecessor and exceeded the previous generation. And how did he get there? I think you probably know the answer already. We'll start at verse 1 of 2 Kings chapter 2. And it came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven. Oh, wouldn't you want to be like Elijah? Calling down fire from heaven, killing the prophets of Baal down at the river, God speaking to you by a still small voice. When he's about to go up to heaven, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take your master from over you today? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho came to Elisha and said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? So he answered, yes, I know. Keep silent. 
Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on, and fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance, while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Now Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water, and it was divided this way and that, so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. So it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask, what may I do for you before I am taken away from you? Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. So he said, you've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken away from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Then it happened as they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and he cried out, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. As in, Elijah is as good as all of our armies, and if we don't have him, we're stuck. The chariot of Israel and its horsemen. Then he took the mantle that Elijah, oh sorry, he took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and stood by the bank of the Jordan, and he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had struck the water, it was divided this way and that, and Elisha crossed over. And when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. Elisha was put off a couple times by Elijah. And he goes, not on your life, pal. Hey, the Lord has sent me on. But Elisha, was he knew the Lord too. He knew what was about to happen. Elijah's going to leave and he knows I'm supposed to take over for Elijah. And he's not just going to ghost me. And act like, uh, you'll be fine. Figure everything out. And all the other prophets knew that a change was coming. Elijah's going to be gone. He goes, yeah, I know that. That's why I'm not leaving him. Three times, 50 of the prophets stood at a distance and watched while they crossed the Jordan River together. And the only prophet that stuck with Elijah and refused to be sent away was the one who was then told, ask whatever you want and it will be given to you. He said, I need a double portion of that Holy Spirit you got. And did you know that Elisha did exactly twice as many miracles as Elijah did? Elisha was doing miracles posthumously. Elisha died and some guy fell down dead into his tomb and when he touched his bones, he popped up back to life. That's in your Bible that that happened. A double portion of the Spirit. Signs and wonders. But what what gave Elisha the power to do that? His refusal to stop asking just like Joshua, I'm not leaving this place. Because Elijah, I, I, what you did is not enough. I've seen what's happened. Yeah, they respect you, but when you're gone, they're not going to respect you anymore. Oh, Billy Graham will lie in state in the Capitol building. They respect him now that he's dead, but guess what? He's gone now. So, uh, we're in trouble. The chariot of Israel and its horsemen are gone. Chuck Smith is gone. Bill Bright is gone. Billy Graham is gone. What are we supposed to do? He said, I'm not going to stop asking and seeking for the power of Elijah. Let me ask you a very important theological question. Are we permitted to seek the Lord for signs and wonders? Yes. I'm going to ask it again. I want you to answer me. Are we permitted to seek signs and wonders from the Lord? Yes. James 5.15, in fact, commands us to do that. If anyone is sick, let the elders come and lay hands on him and anoint him with oil, and the prayer of faith will save the sick. You know when he says, confess your sins one to another that you may be healed? He's talking about bodily healing in that passage. Not feeling better about yourself, although that happens. In Acts chapter 4, verses 29 through 31, when the apostles were first arrested and threatened, if you preach in the name of Jesus again, we're going to do to you what we did to Jesus. They got together and they prayed and they said, Lord, look upon their threats. Grant your servants to continue and speak your word with all boldness. And we've prayed that before. Lord, stop them from oppressing us and help us to keep preaching. But there's a third thing they prayed for. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Lord, 
protect us against the government. Lord, help us to preach the gospel faithfully. And Lord, do miracles with us. Did God like that prayer? When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, by the way, same crew from Acts chapter 2. And continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Signs and wonders are biblical things. We are permitted and instructed to ask and seek after those things. Now, half the church is obsessed with that. And that's all they want to talk about. And, the, and really, the gospel is much more about God can heal your body than God can save your soul. Okay? But then there's the other half of the church that wants nothing to do with that. And they think that's all aberrant and that's not good and I don't want to be like them, so I'm not going to talk about that stuff. Prophecy is just when you preach the word faithfully. Healing is just, you know, it's in God's hands and if he does it, he does it. We shouldn't expect any of these things anymore. Meanwhile, the world is desperate and going to hell in a handbasket. Prayer for the power of the Holy Spirit is exemplified to us by Elisha and by the early church as it needs to be persistent, consistent, and insistent. You keep asking, and you keep asking for the same thing, and you insist Charles Spurgeon explained prayer as, you're like a lawyer. You take the law, God's promises, and say, God, you said, and this is what I need, so God, you need to do this. Well, I don't think we should approach God that way. How? Like a son? My sons come into my office all the time. Dad, I need stuff. Is that inappropriate? No. If my son came to me and said, Father, you, you may have noticed that it is dinner time, and you know, I know you've fed us every meal before this, but if it's within your will, would you please, Lord, provide it and maybe just a scrap of bread? I don't want to ask for too much. I mean, I can handle it. And if you don't feed me, then, then would you help me to get through this? I'd be like, what is wrong with you? I'm your dad. I want to feed you. I want, I'm the one that you wouldn't even know about this if I hadn't told you about it. And yet we pray, don't we pray like that? Because we're afraid that God's going to get embarrassed if we pray boldly and he doesn't do it. When Jesus is the one that said, ask and you shall receive. How else are we supposed to reconstruct the faith of our children that have deconstructed their faith? You've talked to them, haven't you? Is it working? No, you feel like you're talking to somebody you've never met before. You feel like you're going crazy having these conversations. God, what are we going to do? The Lord goes, how about I send them a dream or a vision? That's how they're getting healed in other countries, right? Well, how about if they've got a terrible sickness that comes and I, I heal their body? How about if they see a wonder? I don't know what a wonder is specifically, but how about I send a wonder into their life? Have you prayed for that? Because I don't know how else we're going to reach my generation. Because they don't care what the Bible says. Amen. It's like, this is what the Bible says. They go, and? This is what the Bhagavad Gita says. This is what my teacher says. And I heard all this stuff was offensive and oppressive anyway, so why should I listen to you? It's because the Lord God moves in power. Pray. God loves bold prayers in his authority. Luke 10, 19, he says, I've given you authority over snakes and scorpions and all the powers of the wicked one. I think the devil's got hold of my daughter. Well, then step up in God's authority and begin to pray. Engage in the battle. Focus your attention not on fear of what's happening with the next generation, but in faith that, man, these people ain't going to get saved unless miracles happen. I guess that means we got some miracles on the way. This is going to be cool. What are we going to do for all these people that have transitioned and mutilated their bodies? You don't think God can restore some of that? How cool would that be? Somebody comes in and they get saved, but they've completely destroyed everything about their body. Are we going to lay hands on them? Would you have enough faith to pray that God restores their endocrine system back to where it needs to be? And if they've had things cut off and removed and replaced, that God can't put it back the way it needs to be? My God is able. My God is able to do that, is he not? And number three, the third ingredient of a revival. So we've talked about victory, right? Social victory. We've talked about miraculous Holy Ghost power. And the third and most important is the gospel. The gospel. We're always out working in the fields and, and harvesting. But revival is when God sends that big old combine down. And he says, we're going to do the whole field in one day. Everybody I predetermined to save in this generation is going to get saved in like two weeks. That's what revival is. The Second Great Awakening recorded millions of conversions. 
Millions. And I read a history book recently, not a Christian book, but I had a whole section in there talking about uh, coming up into the Civil War. And he said, what changed in America? Because we had this kind of equilibrium regarding slavery. Like, we don't like it, but there it is. Says, what, where did all this abolitionism come from? He, this secular historian says that our modern historians have done a disservice in neglecting to talk about the Second Great Awakening and the ministry of Charles Finney. Says, so many people got saved, opened up their Bibles and said, what are we doing? And that's what tipped the scales. It was revival. It wasn't economics. It wasn't social. It was God's revival. Even in Samaria, Acts chapter 8, there was revival among the Samaritans. These half-breed, half-Jewish, half but half-pagan people. They didn't even acknowledge the whole canon of the Old Testament. And there was revival. They were all getting saved. That's what revival does. So how do we get some of that? You're probably ahead of me. Turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. You know there's more people alive now than ever before? Like combined? Like you take all the number of people, combine them together, and it's still not as many as are alive right now? So how are we going to save all them people? Acts chapter 1, Jesus told us how. Being assembled together with the apostles after his resurrection, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? When's the rapture, Lord? He said to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons, which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Jesus said, I'm going to send you out to preach the gospel. And you're going to see people saved all over the world. But don't go anywhere yet. Wait, he said. Don't go. Stay and pray. And the early church spent 10 days praying. You don't think somebody got bored around day 8? You don't think the more aggressive of them were saying, all right, look, this is great that we're praying here, but didn't Jesus give us a job to do? Don't we need to get out and get to work instead of wasting all this time praying here? You don't say things like that out loud, but you think them in your heart and you find a spiritual way to say it. Ten days, and then the Holy Spirit came upon them, and Peter, scaredy cat Peter, loudmouth Peter, steps up and preaches a sermon and 3,000 people get saved because they waited not even Jesus saw that kind of response. And that's not blasphemous. Jesus said in John 14, that's what would happen. And he said, wait and pray, just like Joshua, wait and pray, just like Elisha. Keep asking, keep knocking, keep seeking. The early church, don't do a lick of ministry until you've prayed. I already mentioned the Second Great Awakening. You know when Charles Finney would go to a city, he would send two men ahead of him. Their names were Daniel Nash and Abel Cleary. They would get a hotel room and they would just pray, sometimes for weeks at a time. And a story goes that the landlady of one of their hotels contacted him. He said, Mr. Finney, I know they're with you, but they haven't eaten in, in like two days. And I opened up the door and they were both on the floor just weeping and moaning and groaning. And I don't, I don't know what this is. And he says, ma'am, they're just travailing in prayer. They prayed first. Hudson Taylor said, it is possible to move men for God through prayer alone. He went into the heart of China as an, as an Englishman, and he began to see amazing response like nobody else does. I said, what's your secret? He goes, prayer. I don't speak the language, and I don't know the culture. I'm learning it as fast as I can, but God already knows it, so I spend time talking to him. Prayer. <laughs> Salvation is a work of the Spirit, is it not? It's not, oh, I, I've, I had just the right thing to say. Haven't you found every time you've led somebody to the Lord, you go, really, that's what did it for you? That sermon, that's the one that got you saved? Really, this conversation, I, was, I didn't even, I forgot all the statistics, and I said we didn't have as many manuscripts as we do, and I forgot the verses. Because it's not up to you. It's up to the Holy Spirit who draws and seals and confirms them in that moment. You're just there to give him an opportunity to begin to work. So you look at this nation and you say, oh, I want to see people get saved again. You can worry, you can preach, you can study, but if you don't pray, you're falling short. I want to see revival, so let's get out there and, and talk more. Okay, good, go preach. You're supposed to preach the gospel to every creature. 
We've got to study and get boned up on all these apologetics issues. Do that. People have questions. But are you also praying? Are you also on your knees for these people? If you're not, then you're putting yourself at a deliberate disadvantage. Like you ever watch like a, a UFC fight or a heavyweight boxing match and somebody who's clearly the favorite shows up, but they're not in any kind of shape? You're like, this underdog is going to pound you. Even if you win, you're not going to win like you should because you weren't ready. Why would you show up for the fight out of shape and unprepared? 1 Samuel 12, 23, the prophet told the people, Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. You stop praying for a, j- for a nation, for a, pe- a person, for a family. You've sinned. Have we lost sight of the fact that it is heaven that matters the most for these people, not our own country? I hope not. I hope not. I think there are some people that are fellow travelers with the church in certain matters and certain issues, and they can't stand it when we talk about heaven because they think it's going to mean we're going to give up on this nation. Well, no, but heaven is the most important thing. I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm a sojourner here. And I'm going to seek the welfare of the city to which I've been exiled. But the best thing I can do for these people is to transfer them from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And I think I said this last year, but let me say it again. This rising generation is ripe for revival. They're not so far gone, God can't save them. And if you've ever said that, you need to repent, my friend, like you were so great when God saved you. But consider these people. They're focused. They're focused on what they believe. They're radical. They're willing to break things that nobody else is willing to break in pursuit of their cause. They're selfless. I'm willing to give up my my life and my privilege and all that so that somebody else can step up. They're all in, baby. And they're willing to do what needs to be done. What amazing missionaries these people would make. Do you think they're going to get scared? Do you think they're going to get scared when somebody says, you can't speak in Jesus' name anymore? Like, listen, if I'm willing to cause trouble and wreak havoc and flip over cars for something carnal, now that I've found the truth, do you think I'm going to be less zealous? I mean, consider the hippies, right? The dirty hippies that just needed to get a job. They all made incredible pastors. Because God got hold of them and said, I know you love truth and love. Let me show you what real truth and love is. I know you're seeking after supernatural power. Let me give you the real supernatural power. And let me fill it up with my grace and my love and then send you out. And they change the world. What's this generation want? Justice. Oh, that's our thing too. You have justice, but they're miserable. Why? Because there's no mercy. Imagine when that second beam of the cross slides in. Oh, you've got justice. You're right. Everybody is sinful, and everybody does have something that is worth them being sent away forever. But here's my mercy, and I've offered forgiveness. And now we're on a mission not just to establish justice, but to bring mercy to these people. You don't think that that's something God could work with? And they're going to put us all to shame when God saves them if we don't get our act together, huh? Imagine somebody that radical, but they're that radical for Jesus. Why are we going home so early? It's, sure, it's Sunday morning. Well, you know, we'll come back maybe tonight for prayer meeting. It's like, well, what are we going to do in the meantime? I don't know. Watch the game. Watch the game. What if Jesus comes back? Uh, well, <laughs> we can't control revival. It's a work of the spirit. But you know what you can do? You can do the same work that Jesus does. Hebrews 7.25 says he liveth ever to make intercession for those who will inherit salvation. Jesus liveth ever, as in never stops. He's constantly praying, Lord, save them. Lord, if there's any that you've determined to save, draw them. If there's any that you're going to bring to me, bring them to me. Raise up my people to go out and speak the word. You've got to have more love than anger if you want to participate in a Holy Ghost revival, brothers. These men, all these three examples, the early church, Elisha, Joshua, they all went beyond the generation that came before. They did more. They saw greater victory and greater power and greater gospel salvations because they all had that dogged, immovable commitment to prayer. Agreeing that it would be a good idea to to pray is not the same thing as prayer. You're right, it would be a good idea to pray. Okay, well, are you going to pray? Are you going to get down on your knees and fold your hands and bow your head and pray? 
Prayer is not a gripe session. Let's get together and we'll talk to God about all the things that make us angry. Get a blog if that's what you want to do. You come to the Lord and you ask for his help. And it's not a bargain with God either. All right, God, I prayed for 40 hours this week. Therefore, you have to do what I said. God's a person. He's not a vending machine. But I'll say this. Mark 9, 29 says that some demons only come out through prayer and fasting. And Ezekiel was told, I wanted to bring revival to Judah again, and nobody prayed for it. So instead we have the exile. We look back on that previous generation, these giants that have passed on, and we despair over ourselves. Lord, it's just little old me now. It's us. The guy that saved me, he's passed on. He's gone home to his reward. All the people that wrote my favorite Christian books, they're not here anymore. All the people that knew just what to say, that had finally earned some public respect, are gone. And it's just me. But those in the Bible who surpassed their predecessors were not great organizers. They weren't frothy fanatics. They weren't experts. They were people who were wholeheartedly devoted to prayer, who insisted that God hear them. Simeon and Anna never departed out of the temple, and they saw the Messiah when he came. John the Baptist dwelt in the wilderness and sought the Lord every day, night and day, and Jesus said he was the greatest man who ever lived. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Jesus would often withdraw to desolate places and pray. If we want what they got, we got to do what they did. And Jesus said in John 14, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works than the ones I did will he do because I'm going to my father. Therefore, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Jesus said to his apostles, you are going to surpass my ministry because I'm going to the father and now you can pray and I can give you whatever you need. You get to partner with God in the redemption of the United States of America. Won't you leap at that chance? And I'm not talking about the structures and government and society. I'm talking about the people of the United States of America. I believe, and I'll tell you, I am optimistic about this time. I believe that we are on the verge of a Pentecost that is going to out-Pentecost Pentecost. Pentecost. <laughs> it's all in the hands of the Lord, but I can just, you can see the stirrings in the church. You can see it happening. People are like, God's got to do something. And here we are today talking about revival. You don't think that's God's sovereignty? You don't think the Lord didn't put it on John's heart for us to come and talk about revival? And what's the only thing that you and I can do to make revival happen? Pray. So men, pray. Isaiah 64, I close with this. He said, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. And we say, yes, Lord. But then the prophet laments and says, but there is no one who rouses himself to lay hold of you. To lay hold of God like Jacob said, I won't let you go until you bless me. Prayer. We want to see revival. We want to see transformation, victory, and power, and the gospel advancing. We must pray. It's the only task we've been given to do. And when we've prayed and we've done everything we're supposed to and the Holy Spirit comes and puts a little bit of extra into our ordinary, we'll be ready. And we'll look back and we'll say, it wasn't me. It wasn't our plans. It wasn't our rants. It wasn't our projects, our books, our ministries. It was the Lord Jesus Christ through his Holy Spirit to the glory of the Father. Amen? Amen. Thank you all very much.